Open your Bibles to the book of Jonah. You get to hear me preach this morning, and then you get a break from me tonight, so you can, amen, get to hear Brother Garraway preach, and I'm always excited when I have a chance for somebody to come preach, because then I get to sit beside my wife, amen, don't get to sit beside her much anymore in the service, amen, it's the little things you miss sometimes, amen, but boy, I love preaching, amen, so Jonah chapter 4, and open there the book of Jonah chapter 4. And we're going to start in verse number 7, Jonah chapter 4, verse number 7. I'm going to have you follow along with me. We're going to read down a couple verses, but Jonah chapter 4, verse number 7. Ready? And here we go. Just follow along. The Bible says, But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city? wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. And let's pray. Dearly Father, Lord, we sure do love you. Thank you for the wonderful day that you've given to us. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity we get to hear from the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the message that, Lord, I believe that you gave to me this last week, and, Lord, how it spoke to my heart, Lord, and how much that I want to, Lord, apply even the lessons that you've taught me. But, Lord, as I... Lord, try to apply these and, Lord, and, and, and work on my own life. As, Lord, as I preach these, Lord, would they be a help to somebody else, Lord? Would you bless? Thank you, Lord, for, Lord, the message, Lord, that you've given to me as well, Lord. It's, Lord, it's been prepared, Lord, earlier, Lord, in the week. And, Lord, it's great to see that, Lord, when you, Lord, give messages, Lord, and you uh, prick my heart that, Lord, there, uh, Lord, I may not always know why or, Lord, why you have to say, but, Lord, you always, Lord, know the needs that you have in our lives that you want us to learn from, and even in my own. Lord, I pray that it would be a blessing. Lord, may we take the truth, and, Lord, be spirit-filled listeners, Lord, and apply the truths that are given to us. Lord, may we be better Christians because of it. Holy Spirit of God, would you please fill me and use me? Holy Spirit, I ask that you please would help me to have your words and not mine. I yield myself to you, Holy Spirit, to do your work. I don't want to do what I think should be done. Holy Spirit of God, I want to say what you know that needs to be said. Just ask, Father God, that you would please use me in a special and a mighty way. Lord, I also ask that you would, Lord, just help, Lord, if there's anybody here that doesn't know that, Lord, if they die, that they'd go to heaven. They don't know, Lord, that they're saved. That, Lord, they'd be born again this morning, that you'd prick their heart, Lord, for the need of a Savior. And, Lord, for the Christians in the room, may we be challenged, Lord, to be better Christians, Lord. Lord, would you help those that, Lord, don't pray while we're praying? that, Lord, don't see the need to respect you, Lord. I pray that you would please help them, Lord, to pray. And, Lord, help them to realize that, Lord, you're deserving, Lord, of our respect and deserving of our honor and, our, and, your, and glory to your name. Lord, we love you. Pray that you'd bless now the service. May we listen. May we, Lord, hear the word of God preached. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Jonah chapter 4. I'm going to give you a little bit of, an in, uh, a little bit of a history. Many of you may be familiar with Jonah. But I'm going to preach you on lessons from a gourd. Lessons from a gourd. Some lessons that I learned. Jonah chapter 4, the Bible says here uh, that Jonah uh, had a little bit of a battle here with the Lord, with this gourd. But before we get into that, I'm going to go do a little bit of history. Jonah was an Old Testament prophet to Israel. He was a man of God. And he was used by God. Uh, we know Jonah, uh, he uh, was specifically more of a prophet to the nation of Israel, uh, but God asked him to go out of his comfort zone. God asked him to preach to Nineveh and give Nineveh a message. Well, Jonah didn't like that. And now, uh, this is paraphrasing quite a bit, amen, read through the book of Jonah. It doesn't take very long. Jonah's a, a, a fairly short book, uh, but it gives us a, a, a neat story about a man that tried to run from God. Nineveh was not part of Israel. God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh, but Nineveh was uh, the capital of the nation of Assyria. Assyria was close by. In Jonah 4.2, we can see why Jonah uh, did not want to go to Nineveh. Look there at uh, verse number 2, the Bible says. 
Let me turn here. It says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh, not because he did not want to obey God, but because he knew that God would be merciful. According to this, this verse, Jonah said, I knew that thou art a gracious God. Jonah did not want to give Nineveh a chance. Can you believe that? The attitude of Jonah was he did not, it's not that he didn't want to obey God. He loves God. But he said, but God, I knew that you were gracious and merciful, and I did not want those people to even have a chance. When I read that and I thought about that, and the Lord pricked my heart about it, I thought, wow. That a, a prophet of God, a man that loves God, is used of God, would neglect to give the gospel because he just did not like the people. Wow. He did not want them to even have a chance. Jonah did not know, think about this, Jonah did not know whether Nineveh would be forgiven. As far as he did not know if they would ask God for forgiveness. He, he figured it could have been like Sodom and Gomorrah where God would have destroyed the city. Jonah did, not, Jonah did not know what their reaction would be, but he still didn't even want to give them the chance. He didn't know if they would turn, but he knew if they did that God would be merciful. And he didn't even want the chance for them. Wow, what a thought. So Jonah, what he does is when God tells him to go to Nineveh, Jonah, Jonah flees down to Joppa. Joppa is a city in Israel. It's still there. It's where uh, it's down by the Mediterranean Sea, and you can see where it go. They, they launch the ships from there and go and do trade and things like that. So Jonah wants to go to. So Jonah says, "I'm going to go to Joppa, and I'm going to go to Tarshish." We saw there, verse number two. He says he's going to go to Tarshish. So I looked up. Where is Tarshish? Anybody know where Tarshish is at? They don't really know. But when you look up, a lot of the Bible scholars believe that Tarshish was somewhere around Spain. They're not really sure the city itself is gone, but they believe it's somewhere around Spain. If you look at the map, Joppa's here with the nation of Israel, Mediterranean Sea here. Nineveh's here. Guess where Tarshish is? Across the ocean. You know why God sent a storm and sent a whale? Because Jonah was going across the ocean somewhere. Spain somewhere over here, but we just know that they, they say they know that it's, it was somewhere in that vicinity across the Mediterranean Sea. So God sent a whale because he had to take Jonah back. God gave him his own ride. God sent a whale because they threw him out in the middle of the ocean, but Jonah couldn't give the message in the middle of the ocean. So God sent his own boat. Ate Jonah up, took him back, spit him out on the dry land. Guess where Jonah found himself? Not in Tarshish. <laughs> he found himself back where he needed to be. And he took off to Nineveh. I thought it was so funny. Now, Tarshish, you look this up, means a yellow stone. I just looked it up. It's a yellow stone. So I just said two things about Jonah that why he went to Tarshish. Number one, he was, he was hard-headed. He was a hard-headed man. He didn't want to obey God. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. Number two, yellow, he was a coward. He didn't want to give people a chance. He was a coward to do the will of God. That's, why I, that's, what, that's a lesson that I, 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 that I got from the Lord. Amen. So Jonah gives the message to Nineveh. He finally goes back. It's funny, I was thinking about Jonah. Jonah's like a lot of Christians. When he's supposed to be giving the gospel, you find him on the lake. <laughs> or when, you, when he's supposed to be giving the gospel, he's sleeping. The Bible says he was in the bottom of the boat, snoozing. He's supposed to be in Nineveh. He's supposed to be preaching the gospel. What's he doing? Or he was probably out there fishing for a while, deep sea fishing. I've never got to do that. My father-in-law told me sometime when I come down to Texas, we need to go to Galveston and go deep sea fishing. And uh, I've never gotten a chance to go deep. But I love fishing. Amen. Catfish is my favorite to catch. One time I caught one and it was like this big around. I remember that thing. It was huge. I don't know why I'm telling you this, but it's, it's, it's a neat story. So I was out there fishing, amen, and Dad was getting mad at me because I was catching fish and he wasn't. And he was throwing his line in the same spot I was. You know, you know he's like one of those where he doesn't, he knows more about fishing than you do kind of a thing. But then, you know, because he's Dad. 
but then he always cast his line in the same spot I was going. I thought, uh-huh, uh-huh, nice try, Dad. Yeah. And uh, so I was fishing, and all of a sudden, man, this big old catfish came out, head like this big. I mean, it was just huge. So I thought, boy, that's awesome. I'm not exaggerating. Don't laugh at me. I'm not exaggerating. It was huge. It really was. But I found out why it was so big. Hey, man, it was pregnant. <laughs> so it went, you know, when we cut it open, it went from like this big to like, you know, that big. I thought, uh, but I still say it was that big. It was the biggest fish that we caught all week. But anyway, so Jonah was probably fishing. But Jonah was not happy, as we see in chapter 4. Jonah was not happy that God gave Nineveh mercy. And he was not happy that God spared them. So God asked Jonah, as we saw, we go back to verse 7 and into verse 8. God asked Jonah, he said, Doest thou well to be angry? God says, Why are you angry? Is that okay for you to be angry? Are you doing well because you're angry? Jonah doesn't respond to God. Jonah decides to go to the top of this hill, and he wanted to watch to what happened to the city. He wanted the city to be destroyed. Even though God gave them mercy, he still wanted the city to be destroyed. He still wasn't happy. See there, verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become. Jonah was still hoping that God would destroy the city. How sad. Amen. So then Jonah, uh, God causes this gourd. Gourd is nothing more than a plant. And this gourd grows up in, in, in there in the middle of the, in, where Jonah was at. Probably a, a deserted area. Obviously there's no shade. But God causes a gourd to grow up and give Jonah shade. And then God smites it with a worm. And the worm eats it and it withers. And so Jonah gets frustrated. God answers again. Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? So first he asks, doest thou well to be angry? Referring to about the city of Nineveh. Jonah decides not to answer God, just ignores the question. You know why? Jonah knew God was right. But Jonah didn't want to answer God. So then God gives him a gourd, and God says, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? So Jonah, frustrated, answers God and says, I do well to be angry, even unto death. This isn't just a casual conversation. You can see what Jonah's telling God. I do well to be angry, even unto death. He's arguing. I'm fine. Sure, I should be angry. Of course, he can't give a reason why. He just knows he's mad. Boy, you know, when we get mad at God, there's never a good reason. Amen. Amen. There's never a good reason to be mad at God. Never is. You can give all the reasons in the world that you want, but God is always right. And God always knows what he's doing. When we're angry, it's because we're not looking at it from God's perspective. We're angry because of our pride. We're angry because of selfishness. So the Lord says that he, he looks at Jonah and he t begins to talk to him and he says, you've had pity on a gourd. You cared more about a plant. He said, you're more worried, more angry that I killed a gourd and not happy that I spared six score thousand people, 120,000 people. Jonah was mad that God killed one gourd and spared 120,000 people. Jonah rather that God would have killed an entire city and spared one gourd. Jonah would rather God leave the temporal and destroy the eternal. Jonah would rather that God take care of what he wanted, his selfishness, than God benefit the eternity of lost souls. Wow. I mean, I was trying to wrap my mind around that. Think about that. Think about if you ever got to the place where you would look at the city of Wichita and you would rather God destroy the whole city and just leave you in your home and not give, them, not give anybody a chance to be saved. Just leave us, God. Just kill everybody else. They can all die and burn in hell. We don't, I don't care. Can you imagine that? So after reading this passage... There's a few lessons that God taught me that I want to give to you. A few lessons from a simple gourd. God grew a gourd to teach Jonah a lesson. And I believe we can look at these lessons and we can see some things that God wants to teach us. Number one, lessons from this gourd. This will be probably fairly simple, but think about this. Number one, men of God aren't perfect. Jonah was a man of God, a prophet. 
used of God. He's in the Bible. Eternity he'll be remembered. But he wasn't perfect. Well, you know, men of God do make mistakes. We look at Jonah and boy, we think about all the problems that Jonah had. And he did have some problems. And God had to reprimand him. But you know what? He was still a man of God. And you know what? Men of God are not going to be perfect. Men of God will make mistakes. Men of God will sometimes do things you don't even know why they're doing it. But you know what? God will bless his man and God will take care of his man. God will fix him when he needs to be fixed. God will take care of the man of God. But realize that men of God are not perfect. Where Christians get off is when we begin to think that the man of God is supposed to be this perfect person and when he fails, we get mad at God. Well, God, how come he failed? Because I'm like you. I fail too. Do you know I'm a sinner? Just because I have a shirt and tie on doesn't mean that I didn't have to get saved just like you. I had to trust Jesus to forgive me for my sin. I have to go every day to an old-fashioned altar in my prayer closet and confess my sin and ask God to forgive me. Do you know Jonah had to go before God and get right with God too? Boy, men of God aren't perfect. But where Christians get off is when we think that the man of God has to be something. And when the man of God isn't what we thought he should be, we lose faith in God. God says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. If we'll put our eyes on God and not on God's men, then no matter what happens, we'll be where God wants us to be. Because this is what you do. You put your eyes on God, and you get behind a man of God that lines up with that. If he lines up, maybe he's not always what he should be, but if he lines up, God will bless you. But then when your eyes are on God and a man of God strays, you'll just keep on plugging away for the Lord. And God will put another man in his place to lead. But the problem where we get is where we look at the man, and when the man strays, we follow with him. It's all over America. Remember, men of God are not perfect. Amen. If they make mistakes, they make mistakes. It doesn't mean that we condone them but it means that we stay faithful to the Lord and let God take care of His men. Because you see, Jonah was wrong. God still blessed Jonah. God still saw a city have revival through Jonah. Even though Jonah didn't even have the right heart, God still took care of his man. But who do we find that took care of Jonah? God did. You let God take care of the man of God. Amen. You let God help him. You take care of yourself and you worry about the Lord and you worry about serving God, God will take care of his man. Amen. Number two, Jonah lost his focus. Jonah did lose his focus. He was focused, number one, under that letter A, he was focused on himself. Look there, he was more worried about a gourd that would benefit him than he was about benefiting others. Where Jonah went wrong here, is that he was more worried about having shade from the hot sun than he was about keeping souls out of a burning hell. He was more worried about having shade for a moment in time than he was keeping people out of a burning hell for eternity. Jonah was more worried about a gourd that would benefit him for a moment than he was about helping people that he would see for eternity. You see, most people do not do the will of God. Why? Because they're more worried about benefiting themselves than they are about benefiting others. Most will do the will of God like Jonah, but then they're mad when it doesn't benefit them. Because you see, the will of God may put you at an inconvenience. God asked Jonah to step out of his comfort zone. And Jonah was mad. How dare you, God? And Jonah got mad at a gourd. You know what God said? Look what God says about the gourd. He says there, verse 10, He said, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. God says, I made the gourd grow. You know, God's given you everything you have. God's given you everything you have. Everything you own, God gave to you. And then we get mad at God. Well, God, how dare you take it away? God says, I own it. God's given you life. God's given you a breath. How dare you ask me to do that? 
And God told Jonah, He said, you didn't even labor for that. You're more worried about something you didn't even labor for. He said, and I just asked you to do one task that I've, I've given. See, this is what was also funny. Think about this. Jonah, Jonah was worried about a gourd, and God, looking down, says, Jonah, why would you worry more about a gourd that I made anyway? And he said, why would I not spare? God made the gourd with his own hands, but God also made the people with his own hands. You ever made something? You ever you know, have the privilege to make something, even if it didn't work <laughs> this last week? Boy, I was proud of myself. My wife's hair dryer, you know that thing they dry their hair with? My wife's hair dryer went out. I thought, look, I'm not paying for another hair dryer. I got a brain and I got tools. I can fix this thing. Don't laugh at me. So I go and I'm sitting there fixing that thing and I figured it out. You know, I, I mean, I thought, you know, there was hair all in it. I don't know how, hair gets everywhere. It's just all like all wound up in it, you know, and stuff. So I'm pulling this thing apart, and I do this, and I get it. I figured that I figured that thing out. I figured how to take that thing apart. Well, I had it down to a science. I can make you a hair dryer. So if anybody needs one, let me know. I can make one now. Amen. Don't say no. <laughs> I got this down. So I put that thing back together. Well, I was proud. I thought this is going to be great. So I plugged that thing into the wall, and I hit that on button. You never saw more smoke in your life. <laughs> <laughs> so I threw it away and I said, go get you another hairdryer. I ain't got time for this. I didn't know what was wrong. But boy, I was proud of that thing. You know why? I labored with my own hands. My wife can look at her husband and go, wow. I married a good guy. You ever know, guys, how you do that? You try to impress your wife and then it fails. Boom. <laughs> then I said, just take my money and go get you a hairdryer. So then I got brownie points back again. But you know, you take pride in what you do with your own hands. You know, God made 120,000 people with his own hands. Why would God not want to spare something eternal that he made over, over a gourd? Jonah was more worried that God killed a gourd than he was about man that he breathed into him the breath of life and formed with his own hands out of the dust of the earth. God says, why would you be mad at me for doing that? See, God doesn't understand our thoughts. God doesn't understand why we're, more, why we're mad at God for taking away the temporal, for taking away the physical, and God doesn't bless us because we don't invest in the spiritual. We get mad at God. God, how come you don't bless me? God says, because you're more worried about something that will perish in a night than you are about the souls of eternity. Jonah was worried. Look there. Uh, Jonah's focus on himself because God says there, look, in verse number 10, Thou hast had pity on the gourd. That word pity there means compassion. Jonah had more compassion for a gourd. Had, he would rather God spare it. He cared more about a plant. This is why I tell people that are, you know, we're going to save the trees. And I'm all about it. But how about we save souls? God said, I'll take care of the trees. You take care of souls. God can take care of the plants. God says, how about you go out and go win somebody to Christ? You see, we get wrong where we lose our focus. Churches lose their focus and we try to invest more in the eternal or in the temporal. And we just forget about lost souls. Well, we need to go green. I can't even, as the Bible says, we can't even get ourselves, I can't even get sometimes myself to get out of bed to go soul it. Boy, sometimes like I'll be going through the drive-thru and the Lord will say, man, that guy a track. And I think, oh, Lord, that's embarrassing. Come on, we're all there. We all know it. Hey, man, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm a sinner like you are. And I say, Lord, I can't yet. And then I, and my wife looks over at me. She goes, you need to hand that guy a track. Oh, quit being spiritual, woman. <laughs> hate, hate spiritual women. And then so I give the guy a track. And then, and then you feel better about it because you obeyed God. Amen. We have more problems trying to get ourselves out of bed in the morning, trying to go win people to Christ. We're more worried about the plants. This was a funny story. We went and had a teen activity when I was in Hutchinson. I did this thing where 
uh, they had the, it's like a video scavenger hunt. Man, them things are fun. You ever done one of those, do a video, and you've gotta, you have a list of things you got to do? So we did one for the teenagers, and I said, you can earn buku points if you'll go to Walmart, buy a goldfish, and swallow it, take a video of it. So it was funny. You know, I was waiting to see this video of you know, some kid. You ever done that? Anybody ever swallowed a goldfish? You have to do, you swallow Coke after it, because otherwise you feel it flopping around. I mean, it's just like eating sushi. You know, it's just fresh, you know. So we go to Walmart. I go to Walmart, and the lady refused because she said, that's cruel. I said, ma'am, do you realize when you go to the store and you eat tilapia, what you're eating? <laughs> I said, that's fish. I'm like, ma'am, do, do you not eat beef? And she refused. She refused to sell me at Walmart a goldfish because we were going to eat it. That's cruel to animals. You know what I thought? I said, how about, ma'am, you be as abstinent about abortion than you are about a dumb goldfish? Yeah, that goldfish is going to die, and, and you'll never see it again. But we'll be okay with abortion. going to kill people for eternity. Kill human life. Boy, America's messed up. I chewed her out in the middle of Walmart. I got my Christianity. Ask Sarah. My Christianity was not what it should be, but I chewed that woman out. I said, how dare you? How dare you? I said, you're more worried about a dumb goldfish. Never mind. I'm not going to get into that. Here's another thing. This just came to my mind. This dumb thing about this monkey or gorilla, kid that fell in, they killed the gorilla, and now everybody wants to sue the zoo. Shame on them! We're more worried about a dumb animal than we are human life. All you people that put out 500,000 petition signatures, that's stupid. I told my wife I wouldn't say that from the pulpit. But that's stupid. You know why? That animal's not going to die and do anything for eternity, but the souls of men will. Those children are more precious than any animal that God made. But you know why that we believe that way? Because of evolution. Evolution teaches that we just came from an animal. You're nothing better than an animal in the eyes of evolution. But in God's eyes, you're more precious than anything God's ever made. I'm here to preach the truth. Amen. Anyway, I couldn't believe that. Somebody told me that two weeks ago, and I've been thinking about that ever since. Had to get that out. So he, wasn't he was focused on himself. Then look under Jonah lost his focus. Next, he wasn't focused on people. He did not have the right compassion. You see, many serve God in churches today, but they do it without compassion for people. Many will obey God because they want to obey God, but you know what makes a difference is when you do it because also you love the people. Jude 22 says, And if some have compassion, making a difference. See, you can serve God and God will bless you, but, will, but what will make the difference in the lives of people is when you serve God with compassion for people. See, Jonah served God, but he didn't love the people. Do you serve God? But when you serve God, do it with a love for the souls of men. I'll say this. You'll never be what God wanted you to be until you serve God with a love for people, with a love for souls. All that we do in the ministry should be driven by a love for God and a love for souls. Your life should be focused on loving God and loving others. The word joy, somebody gave me an acrostic one time that was great. If you want to have true joy, you can break it down to Jesus, others, and then yourself. You love God first, love Jesus, and then you love others, and then you love yourself. Put that in priority and you'll have true joy. But can I say that the greatest love for others that you can have is giving them the gospel. You see, God was trying to teach Jonah that the greatest love you can have, you can, you can obey God and God will bless, but what's even greater than that is when you love people so much that you're willing to give them the gospel. In other words, don't tell me that you love people when you've never told somebody the gospel. Because if you really love people, your heart will forbid them to spend eternity in heaven with you. Churches try to help people all day long, and we try to do things and provide for the physical. But my question is, what about the spiritual? What about hell? 
When you truly love people, you can always tell a Christian that loves people. You know why? Because they'll give the gospel. They may be scared to death. I've had some tell me, say, Pastor, I'm scared to death, but I handed out a tract. I at least gave them a tract. You know what? That shows you have a love for people. You may not know how to give the gospel, but you know how to give them something with the gospel. We think that we're doing God's service. Jonah thought he was doing God a, a service. But God exposed his heart when he said to go and preach to a people that maybe you don't like. Jonah, think about this then. He was serving Israel, not with a love for Israel, but only because he just wanted to obey God. And there's nothing wrong with that. God will bless you. But Jonah did not see God do a greater work that God could do through him. Next lesson that I learned. What you learn from this gourd. That God cares more about people than he does a gourd. You know what I learned from this? That God is saying, I would rather spare 6,000 souls than worry about a plant. It's funny because look at the end of there. He says, God says, and also much cattle. God was even more worried about cattle than he was a plant. God says, why wouldn't I spare Nineveh's got 6,000 people and even cattle? He looks at Jonah and says, why are you worried about a plant? He's like, yeah, at least they even have cattle. I thought that was a funny thought. God cares more about people than he does a gourd. Christians, when we get, when we get our eyes off the Lord and get our focus wrong, we care more about the silliest things. We care more about the silliest things in this world. And we make a bigger deal out of utter nonsense. All because we just don't want to win souls. I've done it. I'll be honest with you, I've done it. I've made a big deal to God about nothing. God says you should have gone soul winning. Oh. Yes, sir. Most Christians get to where they're more worried about the things of this world than they are about eternity. But God cares more about souls than he does a gourd. That's why we don't have a go green movement on Saturday. We go soul winning. That's why we don't have a save the trees campaign. I'm all for it. But let's go soul winning first. Give God the priority. Amen. God can make the gourds grow and perish in a night. But God cannot save the lost souls of men, the Bible says, unless there's somebody to preach to them the gospel. Brother Houston's evangelist, great man. Goes all over. This last week they were telling us about a member in a church that got saved because he was preaching. Well, you know what? That, that, that's exciting. People getting saved. You know why he's not an evangelist to the trees? Because the trees aren't going to go to heaven. The trees, the trees aren't going to last in eternity. You know why we don't send out... You know why God's command... Think about this. When God commanded the church, what was God's command? Go and preach the gospel. God's command to the church wasn't to maintain nature. God's command to the church wasn't to make sure that we are green and saving energy. Now, we can, but God's command was to go and preach the gospel. So, Will, you know your priorities are out of whack when you're more concerned about this than you are about soul. Amen. Next. The last lesson I learned is God is merciful to sinners. God spared Nineveh. It was a wicked city, a city filled with idolatry, but God still was willing to give him a chance. God gave Sodom and Gomorrah a chance, but they refused. But we see from Nineveh what God would have done with Sodom and Gomorrah had they not refused. God spared an entire city. Boy, God sure is merciful. But you know, I also, underneath, God was merciful to sinners. God was merciful to Jonah. Jonah ran away from God. He said, God, I don't care. I'm not going to do it. Jonah ran the other way. And the Bible says that God gave Jonah a second chance. Even though Jonah turned his back on God. You know, if you're a Christian, you may have turned your back on God. But God sure is merciful. Aren't you thankful? <laughs> when you mess up and you know it, you can turn back around and go, God, I sure am sorry. Jonah from the belly of a whale. Boy, that would convince me. What's sad is it took the whale, it took him three days and three nights. Jonah probably could have been out of there that second. 
So it took him three days and three nights to finally get to the place where he goes, God, I'm sorry. Well, you know, sometimes God has to put Christians in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights when there's nothing you can do till finally we'll let our pride go and say, God, I sure am sorry. God, I'll do it. But as soon as you do, boy, God will deliver you. But what made the difference is not that Jonah said, God, I'm sorry, but look there. We'll go back to it. Chapter 3. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose. <laughs> Boy, Jonah didn't wait. <laughs> he said, Yes, sir. <laughs> Look, this is what's funny. Maybe you've never seen this. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city, what? A day's journey. What took three days, Jonah was there in one day. <laughs> That man was fast. He's a little fast Jew. <laughs> Jews are short, if you can't tell. Us Jewish people are short. And boy, Jonah was moving. You know why? Because Jonah decided, if God's going to be merciful, then I'm going to do what God tells me. Boy, when you decide to give in to God, say, God, you know, I sure am sorry. God gives you mercy. Now take that mercy and do something with it. Amen. Don't just stand around. God was merciful to Jonah and was even patient with him. And this is what's great again. Even when Jonah argued with God, look there at the last. Jonah had more pity on a gourd, and God still was patient with Jonah and merciful to him. When you serve God, you may not always agree with God, but obedience is the key. God will help your heart, but you just obey. And God is patient. Amen. See, God has no patience for disobedience. God was not patient with Jonah because he was disobedient. Not because Jonah didn't agree, but because Jonah just disobeyed. God's not patient with Christians, not because we may not under, always understand what God's doing, but because we just out and out rebel and just are disobedient to God. Amen. Dear Christian, God wants to use you to do a great work but we're going to have to get our focus back on track. God wants to use you to reach people that only you can. God has a city of people waiting for you. But we're worried more about a gourd than we are souls. What's your gourd today? What gourd do you have in your life that you focus more on? And if God were to take that away from you, you'd get mad at God. Think about that. You have a gourd in your life that you invest in. You didn't do anything to give it, get it. God gave it to you. But if God took it away, you'd shake your hand at God and say, I do well to be angry for that. Last thought. Look at this. Jonah said he would be angry even unto death. God spared an entire city and used Jonah to do a great work. And even after that, Jonah would rather have died than live to let God do that through him. Dear Christian, please don't get to the place where you'd rather just be dead than for God to use you. Don't get to the place where you'd rather just God kill you than God use you. Scary thought. Don't tempt God. God just might do it. We don't know what happened to Jonah. Last thing we know, he's sitting on top of this hill. That probably may be where, jo where God buried Jonah. <laughs> well, I don't know. God doesn't tell us. Because Jonah said he was even angry unto death. Maybe God gave him his wish. But God cares more about souls. How's your focus today? What's your gourd? Amen. Are you focused more on the temporal than the eternal? Well, I tell you, one of the, <clears throat> one of the blessings was... We went to that fellow's house yesterday. We were giving him the gospel. And you know, you can always tell when God's working on people. God wants to do something. God's been working on him. And he had some things in his life where God brought him into the belly of a whale, so to speak, in his own life. And when I gave him the gospel, boy, he just sat there and he listened. He started writing verses down. And you could tell by his appearance that, he's, that he wasn't a churchgoer. 
by any means. You could tell he's more of a partier, more of a, he was a young man, probably younger than I. You could tell he was just more into life at one time, but God brought him to a place to where he finally said, I'm going to look, find God. When I gave him the gospel, boy, it wasn't me. God did the work. Boy, he accepted Christ as a Savior. You know, I sure am glad that God was able to use me. And I want God to be able to continue to use me. You know, God wants to use you to do that. God wants to grow you to the point to where somebody's looking for, for the gospel. And God wants to use you to give them and show them how they can be saved. I say this, you can always tell what a church is more concerned about, whether or not when they go soul winning. Look at all these other churches in town. Do they care about souls? They could care less. There's no altar call. They're more about rock bands and contemporary worship than they are about telling people the gospel. I'd hate to be a part of a church that could care less whether, people, whether or not people die and go to hell. That's why we won't buddy up with some of these churches around here. Because they don't care about souls. They just care about money. They just want your dollar. They care less whether you die and go to hell. Just give them your money. Boy, I don't care what you do with your money. God tells you what to do with it, but you do whatever you want to. But are you saved this morning? Boy, God is merciful to Nineveh. God will be merciful to you. It was sad yesterday. Last story, I told you that. I lied to you. I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. When we were at the River Fest, uh, again, I was talking to a man, and I gave him a track. I said, hey, this tells you how that you can know if you died, you'd go to heaven. He looked at me, and he said, you don't know what I've done. He said, I'm a Marine. He said, you don't know half the blank I've done. He said, God can't love me. My friend, God can love a Nineveh. God can love anybody. Doesn't matter what you've done. Maybe you sit here this morning and you go, you know, God can't forgive me. I'm, I'm too much of a sinner. God forgave an entire city. And they were a wicked city. Wicked. I can't even say what they did because we have children in the room. Wicked city. And God still was willing to be merciful. My friend, God will be merciful to you. You just got to be willing to trust Jesus. And I tried to do that as he walked away. He said, God can't. I said, I said, hey, just think about it. I said, God can. He walked away. He said, I'll, I'll think about it. Boy, I pray he thinks about it. Because God can. Amen. What's your gourd? Don't let God have to teach you a lesson from your own gourd. Learn from Jonah's. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we sure do love you. Lord God, as you gave me this thought, Lord, a while back, and then, Lord, you allowed me to, Lord, develop it even more. Lord, like I said, I love to see, Lord God, how you work in my own life. And you use a message, Lord, to help me. Lord, I'm not much, and I'm sure I'm sorry, Lord, that I fail you. But, Lord, I want to be able to be a soul winner. I want to be willing, Lord, to give people the gospel. Help me, Lord, to not have a gourd in my own life that I worry more about than I do about the souls of men and women and children. Lord God, would you help our church? Lord, we're not always able to go soul winning every day, every hour. But, Lord, when you do give us the opportunities, may we, Lord, take advantage of it. May we, Lord, not let you... Uh, or, Lord, may we let you use us. May we not let our lives get in the way of you using us to do a work. Thank you, Lord, so much for loving us and being merciful to us. Thank you, Lord, for being merciful to me. Lord God, I deserve to be in hell. But thank you, God, for forgiving me and allowing me to still be used. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you'd still allow me to, Lord, be used in the future. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. Lord, again, I pray if anybody here, Lord, is, would say like that man, that, Lord, they don't know, God, if you, are merci if you could forgive them, Lord, God, may they understand and know how great and how deep your mercy and your love really goes. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the message. May we, Lord, as we have an altar call, as we have a time of invitation, may we, Lord, do business with God. May we not, Lord, allow the devil to have a place and a foothold in our lives. May we not even allow, Lord, our own personal beliefs to get in the way. May we come down and commit ourselves to you at an old-fashioned altar. And may we just give in to the word of God. We sure do love you. Heads